Well, joining me today is one of our graduating senior, seniors, Connor Hofstetter. <laughs> Got a great fan club sitting over here, I noticed. Connor, would you tell us where you went to high school and what are you doing next? Yeah, went, so, it's past tense now. Yeah, I just graduated from Orchard Park High School. Let's go. And uh, I plan on attending Messiah University in the fall, so. Woo! So we get to celebrate Connor, and he's grown up in our youth ministry as well as Young Life and has had a few opportunities to speak throughout both of those. And so we thought it would be an incredible moment to have him help with a sermon today um, as kind of almost this culminating moment. Um, hopefully there's many more opportunities in your future, but today is one of them. And there's actually seniors at several of our campuses who are helping to preach, which is an awesome thing to celebrate. Well, I'm going to turn to a bit of a downer. So we're just going to bring it down low here and just say in July of 1914, 30 countries were at war together. It all triggered because of the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria being assassinated in the Balkans Peninsula on June 28th, 1914. And within a month, over 30 empires and countries would be fighting one another. This war would drag on until 1918. And it, the combat was seen in the Pacific, Africa, the Middle East, uh, much of Asia, Europe, and in the Atlantic. It was commonly called the Great War, and conservative estimates put the total death toll around 14 million people um, as a direct result of this war, not including those who died later of injuries or other issues that resulted from the war. This was an especially deadly war because of humanity's innovations in warfare, uh, there was new weapons like the machine gun or gas attacks or tanks that were used for the first time. And it resulted in exactly what it was meant to, horrific death. And so millions died in this war that we called the Great War, and it was received the moniker, the war to end all wars. But we commonly now refer to that as World War I because there was a second global comment, con conflict that followed about 20 years later, and many more wars that have followed since where millions have killed and perished due to humanity's inability to get along. And you see, this war was started because of alliances and other things. If you remember history class, there was the main acronym. Um, but really, it, if you boil it down, it's because people wanted to impose their ideas on one another. They wanted their way of thinking to be the right way of thinking, and they decided to demonstrate that through the means of armed conflict. They wanted their way of peace to be the only way of peace. That if they could achieve it through military might, well, everybody would be at peace because we're in charge and we know it's right. But as we all know, that's really a false peace. That's not real peace. And all month we've been talking about this concept of peace. Uh, we've been examining the book of Romans as we've done that. And we'll be in Romans chapter 12 if you have a Bible and want to get there. But in Romans, there's this Greek word that we've been looking at. It's arene, and it means peace, but it has a famous Hebrew equivalent that pastors love to pull out, shalom. It's a synonym in Greek and in Hebrew for the same word, arene and shalom. And they both mean something greater than just this absence of conflict. Absence of conflict is when somebody has won and is in charge, right? But this peace is far surpassing that. This peace is God's overwhelming, surpassing peace. It's how God intended things to be in the garden, how things will be when all things are set right, when his kingdom comes. That's the peace that we read about here. And we started by talking about, uh, in Romans, where it talks about us living at peace with God. That all of this is possible because God has sought to make peace with us through Jesus and his sacrifice in our lives. And without Jesus, none of the rest of this happens. So if you don't hear anything else, here Jesus brings us to peace. But then moving forward from that, we discuss what it looks like to live at peace with ourselves, because we know there's a lot of self-conflict out there. And then last week, Pastor Paul started us on a conversation of living at peace with one another. And we read from Romans chapter 12, and we're going to wrap up Romans chapter 12 today as we continue that conversation of what it means to live at peace with one another. And this is what it says, starting in Romans 12, verse 17. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's been our theme verse, verse 18 there. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This short passage has multiple references to the Old Testament in it and to the law. Because humanity has been pursuing peace since the moment sin entered the world. We've been seeking to have that reconciliation between us and God and us and others from the very beginning. And so throughout scripture, we see this narrative of humanity pursuing peace. And if we're truthful, humanity still really hasn't found that peace. We are at war with one another about everything. Just think of politics. Or think about the clothes your children wear, and maybe the conflicts that arise in your home over that. Maybe even what social media is used, or what so-and-so said at school, or what your office coworker did or didn't do, and the conflict resolution you're trying to find with HR. We are at war with everyone over everything. And the problem is, it's not just face-to-face -face anymore, it's everywhere. It's in the office, it's at home, it's online on Facebook, it's over text message, it's in an email thread, it's in our Slack chain from work. Conflict is everywhere. And it shows up in a variety of people. Offense is given and readily taken. And I am as much part of the problem as everyone else. I come from a household of four boys, and when mom and dad weren't looking, we solved the conflict with some wrestling, and we might still do that if there's a pool available. <laughs> but we definitely conflicted a lot as four brothers, and I have learned that's not necessarily the best way to display conflict resolution. But I know that's how I grew up and how maybe I even portray conflict. So I'm learning a lot from this message series as well. Because when we look at this portion of Paul's letter, He's not suggesting. He's commanding us to be people of peace. And he's commanding us to live differently because we believe in Jesus. And finding peace with others is part of living in the way of Jesus. So that's what we're looking at today. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Church, I hope we don't actively do evil in this world because we're meant to do the opposite. We're meant to live in goodness, to create beauty, and to cultivate the world around us. To start, we should look at what we agree on, a base level of human decency, and then start there. Paul in Galatians reminds us that self-control and gentleness are both fruits of the Spirit, and we're responsible for how we behave and react to others. Scholars think that verse 18 is giving us a little bit of leeway because it's not possible to live in God's surpassing peace. While this is true, it's still on us to be people of peace. Peace depends on us living like peace depends on us. It doesn't mean if you had an abuser in the past, you have to talk to them regularly or go out for coffee on Tuesdays. But maybe it means that you need to separate from that person. It's still on us to, be, to make that step. And I can almost hear the response, but what about when Jesus flipped the tables or when he said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword? How do we reconcile this? Paul is telling us to live at peace, but Jesus is taking on the Pharisees and challenging people. What do we do? Well, in Matthew 5, we read, you've heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if he wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one that asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. On face value, this may seem to contradict Jesus when he tells us that he came to bring a sword. But there is a fundamental distinction that means these statements are not contradictory. In Matthew 5, Jesus is describing how we should behave as his followers. But in the earlier passage, Jesus is describing his own behavior and himself. We are not the same as Jesus. Jesus is God. We Amen. do not have our own power to judge others. But Jesus, who is God, certainly does. So, Jesus is pretty big on peace, it seems, for his followers. And 
Paul isn't adding to Jesus or contradicting him, but actually further explaining what Jesus meant. And that means peace depends on us, not being a doormat, but being people of mercy. We need to carefully examine the circumstances around situations where Jesus was the aggressor. It is, defend, it is to defend individuals weighed down by systems of oppression, unjust systems that may have overcharged or even religious burdens. When Jesus strikes out, it's to defend the poor and powerless. He's trying to bring the world back to his shalom, to his arena. I like how Martin Luther King Jr. put it when he said, but peace is not merely the absence of this tension, but the presence of justice. And that's from a sermon, When Peace Becomes Obnoxious. That is a great sermon title, When Peace Becomes Obnoxious. Well, I think, as Connor was explaining here, that we need to look at this as what are we responsible for and what is God responsible for. And when we read these verses, it clearly kind of makes two categories. Verse 19 says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written... It is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. So there's things that fall into the category of our work and the category of God's work. And I think sometimes we conflate those two things. Though we are made in the image of God and though we're his people, there's still distinct responsibilities here. So when I hear the word revenge, I grew up watching some good Western movies. And so I think of John Wayne pulling together his posse of individuals to get some frontier justice here. Let's ignore the fact that John Wayne was outside the boundaries of the law as a vigilante in most of these movies. He was just going to make things right. And so he would take his group of guys, they'd go settle the score, typically through violent means, right? And none of us really, as far as I know, go about killing people to set things right or justifying ourselves in that. I had hoped not. And if not, we have some great counselors you can speak to, not actually in tongue-in-cheek, but in reality. But... I think we do respond in anger sometimes to settle the score. We like to be the ones to throw a Facebook comment out there to let them know, actually, do, 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 do. Or we're the ones at the barbecue when our Uncle Steve, and I'm sorry if you're Uncle Steve, I don't mean to come after you, but it, when Uncle Steve brings up politics, we're the one who pulls out the stat sheet of the opposite side and starts saying, well, during my presidency, and let them know. We're not necessarily about going pursuing violent means, but our communication can sure be violent with one another. And we try to go settle that score and take vengeance when we're not supposed to. This verse says to create space, to leave room for God's wrath. That when we're the ones doing that, we're stepping into the position of God. That we're getting too close to the situation. It actually says, leave room for God to act create space for God to work. And when it says God's wrath, it, the biblical imagery, yes, means anger and frustration, but it, it, the metaphor here is of a fruit in Greek, a fruit ripening until it falls off the tree and bursts open. That it's so full of juice and meat and deliciousness that it can't contain it anymore. And God's wrath is given this image because it's coming at the appropriate time when it's meant to, not when we mean it to. So if we know that, and that God's wrath is coming in his time, then we can step back and say, I'm not God. So this conflict, whatever it may be, and we might need to do some conflict resolution, we might need to get together and solve some things, but we are not to take vengeance or strike out or purposely try to harm someone, whether that be in our communication, physically, or in some other way. We are meant to leave God room for justice. This passage is quoting from Deuteronomy, where it says, it has been written. This is in the law of Moses. This is in the beginning of the Bible. This is revealing God's very character, that God is a God of justice, and that he will bring about justice in his own timing. But he is the God of justice, and we are the recipients of that justice. And so we need to step back Leave room for God's wrath to ripen and come at its appropriate time. Because we are not God, and he is. Because God is love. Love, we think of as being soft and cuddly, and it is, but it also will defend the object of its affection. Love will always seek to care for what it loves, when it's been harmed, when it's been hurt. 
And so God's love for us, for the poor, for the oppressed, for the powerless in Scripture is on display regularly, that he regularly rectifies those situations because we are the object of his affection. And because he is love, his justice will come about in his own timing. God is going to set things right because that's on him and it's in his character. Living at peace, however, is on us. The peace God has given us is meant to be taken to others. It's countercultural, even subversive to the culture at large. But that's the beauty of this way of living. It shows others God's goodness. Verse 20 quotes one of Solomon's Proverbs saying, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I can't help but think of the idiom, killing him with kindness. It's the opposite of expectation, but it's a better way to live. Caring for those who hurt you is the biblical outlook on conflict. And I'm no stranger to conflict, trust me. I was voted most opinionated in my senior class. Mm. And let me tell you, it was very deserved. It wasn't just an out of the blue thing <laughs> at all. Because I've gotten in plenty of conflicts over politics, over religion. But ultimately, I think the thing that I've learned most from this is that at the end of the day, after arguing with these people, I sat down and ate lunch with them, quite literally, at the school. That even though I'm not going to lay down and be a doormat, like I said earlier, and I'm still standing up for what I believe in, at the end of the day, we can still reflect God's goodness to others. We can still be at peace with them. We can still be friends with them. Some of my closest friends are some of the people that I disagree with the most. And I cherish that. Because God's peace doesn't mean everybody has to think the same way. And it doesn't mean that you always have to give on, in on what you think. But what it does mean is spreading goodness, spreading peace, spreading joy. Jesus asked us to live like the Good Samaritan. Solomon goes further by saying, and the Lord will reward you. There's blessing in seeking the good of those who hurt you. What if we prayed for people who hurt us or who disagree with us? What if we prayed for the goodness of people who hurt us instead of just an end to the pain? Peace, depending on us, often requires us praying for those who we conflict with. Rather than justice or vengeance, what if we turned around and outdid them with goodness, with love, and with service? What if we respond to hate and evil with care and saw the human person harming us as someone else trapped by sin and in need of a savior? What if we saw them as the divine image bearer they are, who also has human needs just like us? So let's make this very practical. We're looking at other people and we're frustrated with them or they're frustrated with us, but we all are image bearers of God. So what does that mean? Well, the world does not need us to comment back to everybody on social media when we disagree with them. The world needs us to love them and to seek to talk to them in person because they're human too. The world doesn't need you to own the libs or make the Republicans look silly. There's enough opposition already. The world needs us to be bridge builders between opposing ideologies because we need that. The world doesn't need you to start a fight every day with your, every holiday with your family or to continue that fight when somebody started it. You have limited time together with your family. You need to make memories. The world doesn't need Christianity to win every culture war. The world needs us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, living like Jesus asked us to live. The blessing Connor spoke about is in Proverbs. It's what Paul was quoting. And, and he cuts off that quote there, the line before he says, you will receive a blessing. And that blessing is not referring to material wealth. It's referring to the world looking like God intended it to look like. It's referring to the world looking like we pray in the Lord's Prayer here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're talking about. That's shalom. That's arene. That's peace. In 1914, when World War I began, uh, there was a large propaganda push from almost every country who participated targeting young men specifically who had just graduated high school. And the vast majority of conscripts to the militaries were in the 18 to 19 to 21 year old range. Why? 
because they were fed this propaganda that they were going to win the war effectively, quickly, and dominantly. But as we know, no side really won that war to start. It lasted for many years, from 1914 to 1918, in November of 1918. And it quickly settled into a stalemate with no man's land in the middle and trenches on either side, firing rifles across the, the middle and machine guns gunning down men by the thousands as they ran across. Many of them 18-year-olds who just graduated high school. But that first year, December came. And journals from British soldiers report that one night, Christmas Eve, they heard caroling from across no man's land. They heard the German soldiers singing Joy X Noel, Joy on Christmas Day. And they started peeking over the trenches and seeing German soldiers put candles along the trenches. And so in response to this enemy fire, the British started singing carols in return. And they started having a battle of Christmas carols across no man's land. And then one shouted out from the German side, come on out. And the British said, I'll come out if you come out. And up and down the western front of World War I, not in every location, but in many, men crossed into no man's land and shook the hand of their enemy. They exchanged small gifts of cigarettes, of socks, of photos of families. In one place, no man's land became a cathedral where mass was held, Christmas mass was held that night. And they partook in the Eucharist, communion. Because that spot in no man's land for a moment was a picture of shalom. They set their rifles down and saw one another as human. They played a game of soccer, they ate some food together, and they buried the dead alongside one another. And as we know, that war dragged on for several more years, mainly because the higher-ups were so infuriated they ordered more intense fighting the following days. But multiple soldiers' journals and, and first-person um, reports tell us that those men who met with one another often couldn't aim at one another again. That their rifles were pointed up into the sky when they were ordered to fire. Why? Because they had experienced relationship. They had experienced peace. They had experienced goodness. And they saw that the other person was human too. So no man's land became a cathedral. And God's goodness was felt. See, too often we find ourselves fighting a war we don't need to fight. And we respond with, to evil with evil. But Paul concludes by saying, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, don't let your anger make you do evil in response to the evil you see. Don't make your experience of evil make you turn to evil as well. But respond with goodness. Being a people of peace means responding to evil with goodness. Peace depends on us responding to evil with goodness. We can summarize this bit of Paul's writing like this. Peace depends on us being a people of mercy. And that in practice means maybe not replying to the person on Facebook or on Twitter or in the YouTube comments if you're younger than 40. Um, <laughs> maybe it means having mercy on that person. And even if the comment is stupid, refraining and showing them God's peace. Peace also depends on us praying for others, even those who hurt us or who annoy us. Trust me, I'm not a stranger to being annoyed. I have two younger brothers. That doesn't mean I can't pray for them and we can't live at peace with one another. Peace depends on us responding with goodness to those who might respond with evil to us, but it's our responsibility to respond to them and overcome, as Cable said, evil with good. Peace depends on us, living like peace depends on us. This idea, it turns the world upside down. To live at peace, to actually live like God's arena, his shalom, will be hard, and it's different from anyone else. It will mean that we get lumps and bumps from others. We may be the ones who are bullied, who are silent, or who give mercy when it doesn't make sense. 
But that's the beauty of God's way. It doesn't make sense until you've experienced the life that it offers. Yeah. We are offering the way of Jesus when we live at peace with others. If the whole world is going to experience this all-encompassing peace, we need to live knowing peace depends on us, living like peace depends on us. Let me close in prayer. Father God, I pray over all of us in this congregation and us here up on stage. I pray that we can bring your peace to the world, that we can reflect your goodness to others, that when people respond to us with evil, we respond to them with good, that when people ask to borrow from us, we give generously. I pray that we can bring this peace out of this Sunday sermon and into the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday, and the Saturday, that we can live permanently in your peace. And, as Cable said, make earth look a little more like heaven. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.